Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Katalin, from My Wellness Workshop. I'm an economist turned nutritionist, a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, nutrition and holistic wellness educator. I'm local chapter leader of the Western A. Price Foundation in my homeland, Budapest, Hungary. I'm very excited and honored to have Sally Fallon Morel as a guest on the show today. Sally is the founding president of the Western A. Price Foundation, a nonprofit nutrition education foundation. Sally is the editor of the foundation's quarterly magazine and author of America's best selling cookbook, Nourishing Traditions, as well as other books, including Eat Fat, Lose Fat, and the Nourishing Traditions book of baby and child care. Thank you for joining me today, Sally. Can you hear me right? I can. I can hear you very well. And I'm just thrilled to be on your show today. Delighted to have a chapter in Hungary. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming to this interview, and I'm very honored to talk to you. First of all, can you please tell us who Weston A. Price was? Yes, Weston Price, was. he was actually a dentist, and he worked in the 1930s and 1940s in the United States, and he wrote a wonderful book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, which describes uh, his 10 years of research among non-industrialized people. And he found that um, he found 14 groups that had perfect dental health. That means they had virtually no cavities, and they had excellent dental structure. That means that their their teeth were naturally straight. Nobody needed braces in these communities. Their faces were broad and attractive. And not only with, did they have excellent dental health, they had excellent health overall. So um, he found these groups, and then he was able to describe their diets for us. And that's the part that's very useful. Mm-hmm. So how, how is it used for, for, for us? Okay. So, of course, these people were only eating natural foods. Uh, they weren't eating any junk foods, any processed foods. All of the foods were uh, natural foods, no industrial foods. And all of these groups did have animal foods in their diet. I think that's very important when we talk about uh, veganism today. It's so popular, but all of these groups had animal products in the diet. But the, the key finding, the key finding was that wherever these people lived, whether it was in the frozen north of Alaska or the beautiful tropics of the South Pacific, uh, in Switzerland, in um, Scotland, wherever they lived, they had very high levels of three vitamins in their diet, extremely high levels of vitamins A, D, and K. And we find these vitamins in foods like organ meats, in butter and egg yolks from pastured animals, in certain types of seafood, in things like fish eggs, fish heads, uh, cod liver oil, uh, so and and mainly in animal fats of animals that are raised outside. And the reason this is so important for us <clears throat> is that these are the very foods that we are being told today that we should not eat. We are avoiding yeah, the very exactly. foods that traditional cultures felt were so important for our diets, and particularly if for the diets of pregnant women and growing children. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, so talking about these very healthy foods and these fat-soluble vitamins, Dr. Price has found that when, when those people in these traditional cultures deviated from these, these very healthy traditional diets, then their health started to compromise. And this is actually what we see nowadays, right? <laughs> because uh, yes, in the, well, the, uh, immediately the people, when they started to eat the white man's food, uh, immediately they suffered from terrible tooth decay, which caused a lot of suffering and pain. But it was the next generation that saw drastic changes. The children uh, were not as robust and healthy. They had more narrow faces. They had crowded and crooked teeth. And they became very prone to Western diseases like tuberculosis, uh, cancer, heart disease, and so forth, and childbirth became very difficult. You see, when the face is broad and the teeth are straight, it's a sign that the pelvic opening is round, and that is the ideal op- uh, 
space for a baby to come out. Uh, once they started eating the processed foods in the next generation, the face was more narrow. Then the pelvic opening becomes oval or elliptical, and then it's much more difficult to have a baby. Uh, having a baby goes from being easy and painless to being extremely painful and life-threatening. Yeah, so it's amazing how many children we see nowadays walking around, you know, with these braces and cricket teeth and, and, you know, all the problems with the teeth. Yeah, and that's particularly tragic in Hungary, I think, because the traditional Hungarians have beautiful faces, beautiful broad faces and high cheekbones. We associate that kind of beauty with Hungary. (laughs) And to see see that happen in a place like Hungary, I think, is is very tragic. But no population is immune from these very negative effects. Yeah, yeah. So it's obvious that children's health starts with the nutrition of their parents, right? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think today people think that they, you know, well, they have babies without thinking about their role, their responsibility to eat properly. And then when something goes wrong, I say we blame it on the three Gs, which is germs, genes, and God. I'm not sure how that will translate into Hungarian, but I call it the three Gs. We say it's... um, oh, it's genetics, or it's caused by infections, or we just say that's God's will. And the traditional cultures never would say that. They would say that if something was wrong with the baby, it was their fault because either they hadn't eaten properly or they hadn't put enough space between each child. And that was another fascinating discovery of Dr. Price. They they believed that it was important to have at least three years be- between each child. Because of nutritional purposes, right? Right. So, so the mother not... could recover her nutritional uh, stores, have recovered from having a baby, and then so each baby would get the the same uh, same benefit, so to speak, at the beginning. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay. And so, what uh, what is your story in in all this framework? So, how 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 did you? Um, find out the, the work of less than a price and what led you to writing your book, Nourishing Traditions? Oh, my. Well, it's a long story. So I read Dr. Price's work in the early 1970s. I was just starting out with my own family at that time, and I ended up with four children, and I raised them according to these principles. I didn't listen to what the government was saying, and my children got butter and eggs and bacon and lots of fat. Uh, They got organ meats, and they got cod liver oil. And all four of them have grown up to be fully functioning adults. None of them needed braces to straighten their teeth, and they were they were virtually never sick either. So um, uh, I proved to myself you. that this can work. And once mm-hmm. I had more time, when my youngest was in f- school full time, I decided that it was I would write a book that put Weston Price's findings into a practical form for uh, for people, for mothers and families, uh, because Dr. Price's book is a little bit difficult to wade through, for sure. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh, easier to, to get the, these uh, findings from your book and from the work of the, the foundation, right? Like well, uh, for some people, I think it would be, yes. And so in 1999, we set up the Weston A. Price Foundation, which provides, we, we say, accurate information about nutrition. We don't have any um, contacts or any funding, uh, any monies coming to us from the government or from the food industry. We are completely independent, and so we can provide the truth. So you are like a member's foundation, right? We're a nonprofit foundation, yes. And we're supported by memberships. And mm-hmm. I really would encourage uh, the pe- people listening to go to our website and click on Join Now and become a member, and you get our beautiful journal four times a year, all of our information. And I believe some of that is translated into Hungarian. If not, we'd love for um, people to start translating these things for us. Yeah, it is actually, you know, part part of my uh, role or work in, in it is that I'm I'm doing the translations for the chapter website, so I well, make sure that, that make sure that we have them for our website also. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, so, who are who are the members of the foundation? So, what is important for these people? 
Oh, that's a good question. Well, we have 15,000 members, and they are uh, they are from many uh, walks of life. Uh, many of them are practitioners like yourself who have uh, uh, either their doctors or they have um, nutritional practices. Uh, many of them are parents uh, looking for ways to raise their children. And um, we then just have members from the general public. Okay, so... There's a, these are actually people who are seeking out to improve their health, right, and their children's health. Yes, and one of the things the, the local chapters do, people like yourself, uh, because, you see, we're we're recommending that people drink raw milk, that they get eggs from farmers who are raising their chickens outdoors, et cetera, and the local chapters keep a resource list. So someone who's learned about us, become interested, and then says, well, where can I find these foods? Then they contact the local chapter. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm going to mention this re- resource list actually later on. But um, <clears throat> first of all, let's get through the cornerstones of the dietary principles of the Western A. Price Foundations and uh, the guidelines according to Dr. Price's research. Okay. So let's start maybe with the most controversial topic, So, and that would be fats, right? Especially yes. saturated fats from, from yeah. animal sources. So we have been, you know, brainwashed to believe that saturated fats are devil and they cause heart attack and clog our arteries. So I would like yeah. to address, you know, I would like you to address this bad reputation and tell us what evidence really shows based on the research of Western A. Price. Well, all of these diets contain saturated fat and in, in some cases a lot of saturated fat. And... So how do we, uh, you know, how do we explain that these health, diets of healthy people have plenty of saturated fat, and yet our government and our medical institutions are telling us that saturated fat is the is bad? It's the public enemy number one. <laughs> and um, oh. in a nutshell, it's just not true. And if you go back and look at the evidence that they cite for saying that saturated fats are bad. It's just not there. It's it's not good evidence. Um, just to give you an example, one of the main pieces of evidence that they cite is the Lipid Research Clinics trials back in the 1980s, and these were reported as proof that saturated fats cause heart disease. But the trials never even looked at diet. All of the subjects in both the drug group and the control group were on a low-fat diet. So this uh, trial did not even look at saturated fat. And we have the uh, in recent times the nurses' study, uh, which looked at you know hundreds of thousands of people, and they found no correlation between heart disease or any other health problem and eating saturated fats. <clears throat> and we also know from physiology that our bodies absolutely need saturated fats. Our cell membranes need saturated fats. Our lungs cannot work without saturated fats. We can't make hormones without saturated fats. I mean, saturated fats are essential for life. And if you don't eat enough saturated fat, your body has a backup plan, which is to uh, eat carbohydrates because your body can make saturated fats out of carbohydrates. Uh, The problem is that the carbohydrates do not provide these wonderful fat-soluble vitamins that you would get from the saturated fats. And also, the carbohydrates tend to make people gain weight. So this backup plan is not a very good plan for mankind. Mm -hmm. But still, we get a plan. It's a good news, but it's not the perfect one. So the perfect one would be to really include these these, um, vitamins which are found in, in these fats, right? Right. I mean, th- this is just saying we have a backup plan because the body desperately needs saturated fats to function. And mm-hmm. if you don't, if you are not eating butter and um, cooking in lard and uh, doing all of the things that our ancestors did, then you will crave carbohydrates. You'll need to eat more sugar and more flour just to make saturated fats for your body. Yeah, and, and talking about fats. I think it's very important to mention that quality is, is, you know, is very important. What I mean is that it's not the same whether the fat is coming from a healthy pasture-raised animal or from a factory, a factory farmed animal, right? So, can you yes, tell us absolutely. about the difference yeah. between these two farming methods and what it causes to the profile of the meat and the fat of the animals? 
Right. Um, and, but I would say that uh, it's important. Every food we eat, it's important. Quality is important. But certainly for fats, uh, if the fats, if the animals are raised in confinement, uh, all of the toxins that they feed those animals can end up in the fats, and the va- fat-soluble vitamins are not likely to be there. But if the animals are raised outside in the old-fashioned way, then these fats are just a powerhouse of nutrition. And let me just give you one example, and that is pig fat, which I know is a very important part of the traditional Hungarian diet. When these pig, animals yeah, are pig, pig. <laughs> yeah, when the animals are raised outside, this, these fats are a huge source of vitamin D. There's actually a thousand units of vitamin D in one tablespoon of pig fat. Whereas if the animals are raised indoors, there's far, far less. There's about 10% of what's found in the animals raised outdoors. So your your ability to satisfy your body's requirements for vitamin D is um, is um, much more easily met by eating the fats from the animals raised outside. And so then you you don't need very much of them. Your body is satisfied after eating just a little. But if mm-hmm. you're trying to get vitamin D from uh, an industrial pig, <laughs> you'll have to eat much, much more to get to satisfy your body's requirements. Yeah, and, you know, that's, that's what is the, the most important to mention here because, you know, talking about saturated fats, in Hungary it's like people want you know, won't scream out and <laughs> run away, yeah. you know, from the thought of saturated fat. It's, it's you know, it's, it's coming from our traditions. And, you know, of course, we have been brainwashed in the, in the couple of, you know, in the past 20 years and, and or the, so. Yeah. And the question is, the, where is this coming from? Why do yeah, we so keep hearing exactly, that saturated exactly. fats are bad? This, is, this mm. is the This is the picture. I mean, this is the part that most people are missing at this point, that, Okay, we, we, let's go back to saturated fats. Let's take, you know, lard and butter. But yeah. um, we, we are, you know, just kind of missing the point that that it's important that it's coming from from a quality source, and we have to be our own advocates to to search and do our research to find these these resources. Right. So it is important but, to know our farmers, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. But even so, even if your only choice is to go to the supermarket and buy the conventional fats, they are better than the alternative. And the alternative are the industrial seed oils, the cooking oils, the margarines, the spreads, and all of the fats used in processed foods. These are all industrial seed oils, and these are what's really harmful in the um a tr- uh, modern diet. This is what causes cancer and heart disease and um, problems in for, for fertility, problems having children, healthy children. It's these vegetable oils. And, of course, th- these companies are all over the world like a big octopus. And yeah. their, their sales are going down in America because Americans are, you know, uh, they're not using these um, industrial fats as much as they used to. And so they go. What they do is go to other countries to um, uh, push these products, and they do it by demonizing their competition. And the competition, of course, is the animal fats, the saturated animal fats. Yeah, and you know what they are doing. What I've I've been you know I've seen on labels that um, these uh, vegetable seed oil uh, marketers they are using this claim that. You know their product is a is a healthy source of you know these uh, essential fatty acids, the omega, yeah. uh, you know three and six, right. and it's just you know <laughs> yeah, it's a scam. How, how, we should, how we should address these kinds of claims, and you know it's it's big marketing money in in that. Yes. So and by the way, you can get all the omega threes you need from butter and lard. They're all there. <laughs> they're in small amounts, but they're they're not uh, rancid. The problem with the omega threes and the vegetable oils is they're damaged because by the processing, and they they're actually harmful for your body. But in the so, natural animal fats, they're they're just the right amounts, and that they're not damaged. Mm. And can you can you just uh, shed a light on that? How how these processed uh, vegetable oils are are being, you know, made in the factory. Yeah. So. Yes. Well, it's a horrendous process. 
it's uh, it is basically like an oil refinery, just like a refinery for your oil for your gasoline in your car. They use the same equipment. It's these oils when they come out of the seed, they are a thick, uh, sticky, smelly gunk, and then they have to be refined and cleaned up and uh, deodorized and so forth. And all of that involves a lot of heat and chemicals. What they end up with may look clean and smell clean, but it's been bleached and deodorized. And again, it's just, it's just, you, you can't think of anything worse than to put in your body than these uh, vegetable oils and the margarines and the spreads. Yeah. And you know, it's like what I see still now people using these spreads and, and margarines because, you know, it's easier to use because it's, you know, it's not cold, it's just easier to spread, spread on the bread and things like that. And not to mention that it's hiding in all processed foods like cookies and crackers and yes. pretzels and, and chips whatsoever. And yes, yes. You know, it's, it's funny you should say that, Caitlin, because uh, many times I've said to someone, you really should use butter, it's much more healthy. And they said, yes, but the problem with butter is that it doesn't spread <laughs> when I take it out of the refrigerator. <laughs> so for this minor inconvenience, they are using something that is very unhealthy. It causes cancer. It causes autoimmune disease. It causes uh, heart disease and infertility and all sorts of tragic, heartbreaking problems. Yeah, yeah. So actually the bottom line here is that we should go back to you know to nature and we should prefer... Yeah fats and oils coming from the nature and not from the factories, right? Uh, absolutely. Eat yeah. the Summary. foods of your ancestors, yes. Yeah. So, and um, how about, uh, like, uh, on the practical level, that um, how are, how are the, the, you know, oils and fats to be used for different, different purposes, like for cooking okay, and for cold good. applications and well, I, I always say there's five fundamental fats and oils that everyone should have, starting with lard, uh, pig fat, and that we use for cooking. We cook our vegetables in there. We cook our meat. It's a great cooking fat. Uh, then there's butter, and butter we uh, use on our bread. We put butter on our vegetables. We put butter in our sauces. Then there is olive oil, which is really the only healthy liquid oil, and that we use to make salad dressing. So I never buy salad dressing in the store. These are just garbage. Uh, we make our own salad dressing with olive oil. Coconut oil is a, a therapeutic oil, very healthy for us, and I do use that in cooking and uh, food preparation. And the final oil is cod liver oil which, um, again, that's a liquid oil, but it is basically a, a great source of vitamins A and D, and we take cod liver oil every morning as a, as a therapeutic. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned cod liver oil because this is one of the things I wanted to talk about today is um, uh, that, uh, you know, we have, some, we have some traditions of cod liver oil. We still remember some of the great-great-grandmas giving, you know, spoonfuls of that. It's like, you know... <laughs> Yes. No, well, it was all over the world like that, that people but, did it. Yeah. But, yeah, but grandmas and great grandmas used to say that it's very healthy. But nowadays, you know, you know, I, I've I've been curious and I I checked it, you know, in in the health food stores and in up in um, pharmacies in Hungary, and it's it's practically non-available. <laughs> so we can well, we can, can you... order it online, and I know there is a one special. Um, kind of cod liver oil that you are recommending and, and yes. the foundation is um, recommending. Can you maybe tell a little bit more about that and why is it important to also yeah, well, to focus yeah. on quality here? Yeah, it, right. Uh, first, let me say, if you can't get cod liver oil, I'm sure you can get the canned cod livers, and they would be very good, and they taste good, and try to get the canned cod livers that are in the natural oil. And that would mm -hmm. be just as good as cod liver oil. Now, the natural cod liver oil that we recommend is actually made in the United States. It's made by a fermentation process, which was how they used to make cod liver oil. And it's the most effective way of getting the fat-soluble vitamins out of the cell membranes and into the oil. And it's also the only cod liver oil 
well, I won't say only, but it's uh, one of the few cod liver oils that actually has the natural vitamins in it. Most of the oils made in Scandinavia are boiled and heated and filtered, and the um, it takes out the fat-soluble vitamins. So what they put back in are synthetic vitamins. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So and this is actually what we can we can get here in in pharmacies, or we can order this particular product. Or according to your recommendation, we should just go for the real stuff and eat the real liver of, of the fish. Yeah, right? yeah, eat liver. I would say eat liver every week. And you know, I had a Hungarian friend who um, said to me, "You know, Sally, when we make liver, we think there's something missing unless we cook it in lard in pig fat." And that yeah. is so wise because the vitamin D in the pig fat is um, balances the vitamin A in the liver. So uh, and then so we they have are synergistically yeah. working there, right? Synergistically working. So that's the calf's liver. We also have chicken liver, goose liver, duck liver. Uh, these are wonderful foods, and really uh, we should try to eat them every week. Yeah, so that's that's one of the other principles of the of the foundation is that that these traditional cultures um, preferred um, organ meats and livers and and even fat uh, above the the lean meat, right? Right. They never ate lean meat. They they knew that lean meat would make them sick, and so they. Um, they always ate the fat with the meat, and they preferred the organ meats. If the hunting was very good, they threw the lean meat away. They usually just left it there, or they gave it to their dogs. What they preferred, what they prized, was the organ meats and the fats. And also the blood. The blood was uh, considered a uh, very important food, and if they were, for example, if they killed an animal, they took all the organ meats and, and cut them up and put them in the stomach, and they put the fat in there, and they put the blood in there, and they smoked that, and then they, that was what they ate. It was like a pudding. It was called a, a, I don't know what their <laughs> yeah, words were, but okay. we would call it a pudding, uh, like yeah, blood you know, pudding. Yeah. Yeah, you know, my in my mother-in-law's place, <laughs> they are still doing this um, this procedure of I don't know, it's like a ritual of killing the the pig. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. if, you know, the English um, name of it, but it's like a traditional pr- procedure. And we are we are making the sausages and we are making you know the ham and smoke ham and things like that. And also we collect the blood. Oh, that's the first thing we do. We collect the blood of the of the pig. <laughs> Oh, and I would love we, for you to, to, to yeah, you should come and visit. <laughs> uh, I would love to, but um, uh, um, failing that, uh, why next time they do it, I, it would be in the fall, right? Uh, take some yeah, photos for us and and write a little article. I think that would be fantastic, okay. and our members would be very interested. Uh, one of the things that we like is to make contact with. Uh, people who are still doing things the old-fashioned way, and for them to yeah, explain yeah. how they did it, yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's nice to still do this uh, this traditional process, but my main thing is that uh, I'm always concerned about again about the source of the meat because it's it's really not the same when it's coming from from a factory farm or if That's it's coming right. from pasture. And it's a good thing that my mother-in-law, for example, she's living on the countryside. So, you know, people still have these personal connections <laughs> and yes, people know yes. each other, so they know the farmer. But, you know, like uh, in Budapest, which is the capital city of Hungary, we don't really know our farmers. So this is my one of my main <laughs> aims with this work of uh, being a chapter leader, that I really want to, to collect data <laughs> about these farmers. Oh, and that's farmers wonderful. But still, and that helps you know, the farmers, it, too. You know, it, yeah, it provides customers the for the farmers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, uh, I, I find it also important to teach people uh, what to ask from their farmers. For example, mm-hmm. when they go to the farmer's market, and, of course, you know, there are these uh, old ladies and old men say, p- saying that, oh, yeah, it's all, it's all natural and it's, it's all pest- pestured and, and yeah. it's grass-fed and it's, you know, um, free range. But how yes. can we, of course, so we, we have to make, make the effort to, to, to be able to, 
to ask the right questions. Questions, so yes, maybe, to make sure that this is help, true. Can you help us with these right questions to, to ask, to make sure, or how to, of course, you know, it's, it's honesty from their side. Right. But uh, I think that we can be empowered to to be prepared with the clever questions. <laughs> Yeah, well, we know it's wonderful. We have people like yourself doing this all over the world. Uh, we have chapter leaders in many European countries, in Australia, New Zealand. I think we even have one in Singapore, <laughs> and they're doing the mm-hmm. same thing. They're asking these questions, and they're trying to prevent this type of farming from disappearing. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's really, really, there is there is even a stronger need now as people are getting, you know, even more and more compromised on health front, and they are they are trying to you know go back to healthier choices and healthier habits. So there is right. there is, there is a, a movement towards it, but still it's, you know yeah. still need to support it from that that front. Yeah, and um, talking about butter and fat and and things like that, there is one thing I really want to point out here is this activator. X or how you, how you yes. say it. Which Activator is X, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Can you tell well, acti- us more about it? Yes, so Activator X was actually discovered by Weston Price. He didn't really know what it was, so he called it Activator X, but he knew it was some compound, a vitamin-like substance, he called it, that was in all these traditional diets, and it was uh, cons- the foods containing Activator X were considered sacred and, and very important for health. And we've only in the last 10 years discovered what Activator X is, and it's vitamin K2, which is the animal form of vitamin K1, which the animals get from eating green grass. So again, another very important reason for these animals to be outside. Uh, yeah. The best sources of Activator X are things like liver, uh, aged cheese uh, is, a, is a wonderful source, uh, fish eggs, um, uh, foods like this, and, and certain fermented foods as well. And this and is the right? vitamin that gives us the broad face. This is the vitamin that helps the cheekbones grow broad and the, fa- and the teeth come in straight. So it's a very important vitamin for uh, formation of the body and for overall health. It's very important for mental health and for uh, formation of the brain. Yeah, and, and the butter also contains uh, this vitamin K2, right, once the, the cow was grass-fed. Yes, depending on how the cow is fed, yes, the butter is a good source. We're actually uh, just in the process of doing some research on this. We're having a lot of different foods analyzed, and we're very excited that we'll be able to publish this uh, very soon. Mm, okay. So coming back to butter again, is it true that the the deeper the color of the batter is the the more the nutrition it it has in principle yes the butter from the cows eating the rapidly growing green grass that has the uh, x factor in it is tends to be a very deep yellow very bright yellow uh, but you do have to be careful <laughs> because, uh, of course, the manufacturers of conventional butter are allowed to add a coloring to the butter. Uh, wow. But the, so they have yeah, the, the butter from cows in confinement, if you make butter out of that cream, it's white. There's no yellow in it. So they, they add yellow to make you think it's natural. Mm. Wow. Okay. So, and uh, coming back to this organ meat subject and. Um, what uh, what I also found in this um, traditional diet booklet is that all traditional cultures cooked some of their food, but um, all consumed a portion of their animal foods raw. And also, they consumed raw vegetables, which were high in enzymes, right? Right. So there are two important types of raw foods in traditional diets. One is the raw animal foods. Uh, they always ate some of their meat raw, some of their fish raw. They had the cultures that had dairy animals. The the milk was raw, the cheese was raw, and I'm not sure of all the reasons why that's important, but certainly one of them is vitamin B6, which we get from raw animal foods. That's our best source of vitamin B6, and B6 is really a critical vitamin for many many processes in the body. Then the vegetable foods, they had a lot of fermented foods. Um, And I can't think of a better example than sauerkraut. 
sauerkraut, which I'm sure that Hungarians are familiar with. Now, we're not talking about pasteurized sauerkraut or sauerkraut made with vinegar. We're talking about the old-fashioned lacto-fermented sauerkraut. And this is a tremendous source not only of enzymes that help you digest your food, but also of good bacteria. And this is a new discovery for modern science, the importance of having good bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. And traditional cultures got these good bacteria by eating these fermented foods. They fermented grains, they fermented uh, cabbage, they fermented herbs, um, all types of foods were fermented and eaten as pickles. Yeah, and actually these foods are pretty easy to make at home, right? You They're very need easy to, to like make, yeah. the vegetables yeah. and add some salt and basically almost that's it. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes we add a little whey, fresh whey. That's from making, uh, separating yogurt or kefir. And by the way, mm-hmm. many of these cultures, especially European cultures, had the fermented dairy foods such as yogurt or ke- yeah, kefir. Yes, yes, yes. And um, another principle that I wanted to talk about today is like bone growth. Yes, yes. Another thing that it's it's kind of familiar in households in Hungary as well. But you know, people are using these bouillon cubes, these you yes, know these horrible things. <laughs> so I I want I I would like you to to talk about the benefits of the of the real bone growth and how right. to make it and why are, why is it so important and why is it so healthy? Yes, so traditional cultures, almost all of them made use of the bones. They took the feet, the bones, the heads of the animals, and they made broth. And that broth was then used in, in cooking. Sometimes they just drank the broth or they made soup or sauces. And we now know that this broth is extremely healthy. It is rich in compounds that build cartilage and give you healthy joints and um, uh, cartilage and uh, collagen, which we have all over our body. The number one type of protein in our bodies is collagen, and that's what holds us together. And the broth made from these collagenous joints of the animals is very healthy for our own collagen. A broth also is very high in an amino acid called glycine, which helps us detoxify something we very much need in our toxic world. And also glycine is very important for mental health. It gives us mental stability. So all of these benefits come from the homemade broth. Unfortunately, in the bouillon cubes, there's none of the benefits, and they get the flavor of broth from something called MSG, uh, which is an artificial flavoring, a meat-like flavoring, which is harmful to the body, especially harmful to the nervous system. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's so sad about it that, uh, for example, my grandmother used to make the real version of it, but once these these cubes were introduced, she was so happy, you know, because now it's easier and it's so much faster to make the, you know, the broth. And it's just so, so horrible to think about. You know, as a kid, I had no idea about all these, so I was eating (laughs) this soup with the cubes in it. What could I do, right. you know? I, right, so, you well, know, nobody like knew, marketing. nobody knew. And this is the type of thing that happens in industrial, in the industrial society and make the industrial production of food. These things sneak in, and we have no idea of the difference. But we do yeah. have an idea of the difference now. And again, um, they're really... Um, there's no shortcuts. You really do need to make the broth. Not that broth is hard to make. You just save up your bones, um, it's important to have a bone like a, a foot, like a calf's foot or chicken feet, because they're very rich in gelatin. And just uh, simmer those on the stove, and you have your broth. Yeah, and you can also use the the, the marrow inside the bones, right? That's also very yes. nutritious. Yes, Sweet. yes. Actually. Now, I do you use uh, slow cookers in Hungary. A lot of people here have well, slow we, cookers. We, have, we, have a, we don't have like a slow cooker, like what you use in America. But uh, we we just uh, like the way I do it. It's just uh-huh. I put a, a regular cock pot on, on the on the stove top and I put it on the lowest. And it, yes. I just leave it there for even yes. for the whole day. And it's safe right. and, you know, it just makes itself. <laughs> right, it right. Itself. So it's really not, it's really, it's really very easy. It just, mm-hmm. you know, takes longer. 
Yeah, so, right. Uh, but, you know, the problem is with all these MSG and this stuff that, it, you know, it tricks our minds that it's even, it tastes even better, you know, than the real stuff. It's, you know, it's all tasty and it's salty and it's, you know, but it's yes. important well, to know that how, how bad it is for us. Yes, and of course, this MSG is how they get the broth-like taste in um, <clears throat> frozen dinners and soups and sauces, mm. you know, <coughs> yeah. industrial-made okay. uh, foods, yeah. Mm. So talking about taste, <laughs> salt mm-hmm. comes into the picture, right? So and every, again, every this traditional is... diet con- contained, you know, use some salt, right? And also there's yes, a all traditional diets still, contain right? salt. Salt mm. is extremely important. And one of the good things about the modern diet is that we have access, everybody has access to salt. It's inexpensive and it's plentiful. And in the olden days, the way that the rulers controlled the population was to control the salt. And uh, you would do anything to get salt because you absolutely needed salt. <clears throat> so uh, we, we have plentiful salt today, but unfortunately we've learned how to refine the salt and we want to go back to the unrefined salt, and I'm sure you have sources in Hungary of salt. It's uh, yeah, sea salt or mine salt. And uh, yeah, this sure. is the salt with all the trace minerals in it and lots of magnesium in it. So you want the unrefined salt. And you know what is annoying also? That even some companies are doing this, you know, they are selling this unrefined salt, but they put some additives in it so that it won't stick together. Right. So that's another thing to address. That we want we yeah. want to have a salt that is real natural, like and it it has no additives in it. Right, and we get the coarse salt. We have a grinder, and then you just grind your salt, and that's yeah. the way to do it. If you want salt that pours out of a salt shaker, you have to add that additive, and the additive has aluminum in it. Yeah, another 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 bad thing. Toxic <laughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe there are a couple of more principles that I would like to address, which are pretty controversial these days, and one of them is milk. So there is a continuous debate going on within health-conscious conversations, whether milk is good for us or not. But I think the subject of this debate and the the problem lies mostly in in like modern milk, right? So which is very, very far away from real milk. So what is Dr. Real Price milk? Um, <clears throat> found several cultures that drank milk, uh, Switzerland and North Africa, <clears throat> and um, they were drinking raw milk, whole milk, milk from pastured animals. And this is what we call real milk. So there's three components. It's not processed. It comes from pastured animals. has the fat in it. That kind of milk is very healthy. It's particularly important milk for growing children. If you bring up children on raw milk, they'll end up being very tall and very handsome, very attractive and healthy. They'll have very healthy teeth. But the modern milk is a, really a travesty. Uh, they, it's been heated, and I know that in Europe, even more than the United States, they have the ultra-high temperature pasteurized yeah, exactly. milk. This <clears> and, is um, I, wanted to, I wanted you to address yeah. because it, it's a nightmare. Like milk is, is coming in a box today, you know, and, and it's, it's coming like in a box. High temperature treated, and it's homogenized, and so it's and you know you don't even have to refrigerate it. Market. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, it has a shelf life longer than you. So <laughs> right. And and that should never be consumed. Just never, never yeah. touch that uh, stuff. If you can't get uh, real milk, uh, we suggest plenty of uh, cheeses, particularly raw cheeses. This is an extremely healthy food. But we do need calcium, and uh, it's very difficult to get adequate calcium without dairy foods in the diet. Yeah, well, in Hungary you can get raw milk. But again, it's the same uh, thing that I mentioned before that you really should know your your farmer, farmer. because yes, it's yes. not the same when, when that that cow is getting you know this corn based feed and is never has never seen the grass and <laughs> right you it, don't want even if it's even if it's a raw milk that's not a quality milk right right. So, You don't want what we say raw uh, milk intended for pasteurization should not be consumed raw because it will be a very dirty conditions. So you do want the raw milk from animals raised outside. And I can't stress enough, uh, 
couples who are planning for having children, pregnant women, nursing mothers and growing children, uh, the best thing for them is raw milk. We recommend uh, two quarts, excuse me, we recommend one quart of raw milk a day for pregnant and nursing mothers. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it, you have to be very cautious here of, of the quality. Yeah. So you yes. just don't want to get, you know, raw milk from your local um, farmer's market without really knowing and trusting the farmer. Right. So. It's good to go visit the farmer <laughs> and see the uh, conditions. Yeah. And once you've satisfied yourself that these conditions are good, well, then the, you can have the farmer bring it to the farmer's market for you. Yeah. But, you know, there are still so many people who cannot tolerate milk or at least they do better off. For example, like like lactose intolerance is so common right. even in, in children. So yeah. why do you think well, it's happening? It's, it's really pasteurization intolerance. We did a survey and we found that 82% of people who are diagnosed as lactose intolerant could drink raw milk without any problem. Now that still leaves a, a portion of the people who can't do any type of milk. And that's, I mean, that's just, that's sad, it's too bad, but these people would have to avoid milk and maybe some of the milk products also. Yeah, like like these um conditions like these autoimmune diseases, which yes. are mostly, you know, they are involved in uh, casein sensitivity, which is the protein part of the meal. Yes. So, yeah, yes. it is still present. So if you have any health condition, then so if, if for healthy people, healthy raw milk is healthy, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. And even for some unhealthy people, it's, um, we've had a number of cases of osteoporosis completely reversed when they went on to yes. raw milk. Yeah, this raw milk thing is, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure for many people it, it would sound like like a hippie thought. Or should I say, yeah. you know, even even like my great grandma, they used to have the raw milk. They put it in a, you know, in a uh, in a in a pan, and they they br- they Boy, brought it to a very very low, um, you know, it's not yeah. a pre- pasteurization. Pest- you know, what is it so called? So they just boiled it. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, and that's that's what the health is, workers is okay? told them to do. And that's too bad because it ruins uh-huh. the milk. And they actually did studies in Europe and they found that raw milk provided powerful protection against asthma, but if the milk had been boiled there was no protection. Oh, very interesting. Okay. So we should search for the trusted for the good farm. And get the, yes. uh-huh. the raw milk from there. And another huge controversy, and this would be the the last principle that I would like you to discuss uh, with me today, is is you know grains. Grains, and, oh, the big uh, the hot topic. Like, <laughs> what what is wrong with grains? Well, you know, it's interesting that the two foods of civilization, dairy foods and grains, are the foods that we're having the most trouble with, and it's because of the way they're processed. So the milk should not be processed at all. It should be raw milk and then made into your cream and butter and kefir and all that. But the grains, grains are very difficult to digest. And traditional cultures <clears throat> all took great care to prepare their grains. And in Europe, this amounted to either making the grains into beer or into the sourdough bread. And when the sourdough bread is a type of fermentation process that gets rid of all of the irritating components of grains and makes the gluten part of grains easy to digest. And there have been studies in Italy showing that people who were diagnosed with celiac disease, if they ate the true sourdough bread, they had no problems with, with the wheat. So it's, it's uh, always the, the way to, to, to prepare them properly, right? Yes, pre- prepare properly. And you know, the way they make bread today is they can go from a, a grain of wheat to the bread in the package in two hours. And it's, they are very proud of this rapid method of making bread. But bread needs time to to be healthy for us. If we try to make it too rapidly, uh, the wheat is still going to have all of its difficult components, and it will be very difficult to digest. Yeah, and it it goes the same way for for all the other grains, right? Yes, but particularly for the gluten-containing grains like wheat. 
Mm. And how about legumes and nuts and seeds? Well, legumes, of course, are found all over the world. They are a very nutrient-dense food, and they should be in the diet. But the legumes, like beans or lentils, to be soaked, and particularly soaked a long time. Typically, you would soak and discard the water, rinse them, and soak again maybe two or three times, and then they need to be cooked. So these need a good long uh, preparation to be digestible for humans. The nuts we prepare differently. We, we, re- we soak the raw nuts in salt water for six to eight hours, and we drain, and then we put them in a warm oven to dehydrate. We call these crispy nuts. And people have found that they are much less allergenic, uh, much easier to digest than if you just ate the raw nuts. Mm-hmm. So the key is the, the proper preparation for all the, for the grains and legumes and nuts and seeds as well, right? Yes, and you'll find that you you really don't have any problems with these foods if they're prepared correctly. Mm, yeah. Okay, and you have some uh, videos on the on the Western A Price Foundation's website how how to do this preparation. We do. We right? have so um, if you look for our video section, for we have a lot of videos that show how to prepare these foods. Yeah. So for the audience, if you if you choose to to eat these foods, then you have to make sure that you prepare them properly, right? right. That's right. You know, we like to say uh, so many diets today are telling you you can't eat this, you can't eat fats, you can't eat sauces, you can't have salt, you can't eat grains, you can't eat milk. You know, And yeah. we like to point out that our diet is inclusive. You can have salt, you can have fats, the right kind of fats. You can have grains if they're properly prepared. You can have the right kinds of dairy foods. Um, You can even have sweet things and desserts if they're made with natural sweeteners. So there's really our diet is a diet that embraces all these wonderful foods. It tastes delicious, it's satisfying. There's no renunciation in the diet that we're proposing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually... You just have to make sure that all these components and ingredients are cr- coming from quality sources, and yeah. then you have to make yeah. sure that you prepare them properly, and you know to always choose the, the real food and not the mm-hmm. processed food versions of of the same thing, actually. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, we we have to think about our food. Now, in the old days, we didn't have to think about our food. Everything there was good. You know, before mm-hmm. processed foods came in, everything in that was that mankind had as food was good food. But that's not the case today. Today we have to use our our mental capacity and our will uh, to make choices about our food. Every bite that goes into our mouth is a choice today. Now, that wasn't yeah. the case 500 years ago. And, and we have so, to choices. Yes, yeah, so we just need to educate ourselves and make wise choices. And it doesn't mean that we have to um, deny ourselves good food, not quite the contrary. Uh, but we do have to exercise our mental abilities and our willpower to make the right choices in our food today. Yeah, exactly. We have to be very very conscious about it. Right. <clears throat> Okay, so apart from the main dietary principles that we covered, more or less, there are only a couple of subjects that I would like, I would, I think, would be important to to cover, and one of them is uh, baby and child care, and yes. because you know we are all concerned about having healthy babies and raising healthy kids, but what does it all start with? Uh, it, it starts with the health of the parents, right? And exactly. I, I want to. Uh, I have read in in the work of Dr. Price that what he mentioned he he called like sacred food. Can you can sacred you tell food. us more about these these foods? What are yes, those and why are they? Yes, all traditional cultures had sacred foods that were considered very important for men and women in preparation for pregnancy. There was a six month preparation for pregnancy, for women when they were pregnant and breastfeeding, and for children when they were growing. And these foods were all very rich in these fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, and K. So they were foods like butter from cows eating the spring grass, 
uh, eggs was a sacred food in many cultures, liver, fish eggs. Uh, I like to call our diet the caviar and pate diet. The, this, these are the perfect foods for preparing for pregnancy and having healthy babies. And we recommend this nutrient-dense diet for six months before conception, all through pregnancy, all through breastfeeding. And then the first foods that we give to our uh, babies in weaning is foods like egg yolks and liver. Um, <laughs> I have a grandson who, in London, my uh, son and his wife, and I just wrote to them and said, be sure to give him some blood pudding. <laughs> so all of these <laughs> nutrient-dense, yeah. uh, cholesterol-rich foods are the perfect foods for growth and for intelligence in our children. And every child, you know, my goal is to see every child born on this planet uh, grow into his birthright of perfect health and perfect intelligence and, and attractiveness as well. This is our birthright. And it doesn't happen by chance. It only happens when we understand nature's laws and do our part as parents to make sure that babies are pr- properly nourished. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's so beautifully said. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, it's... it's um. It's so interesting because if you really introduce these foods to their to the children's diet early on, then it's it's kind of you know natural for them. That, that you know, like and it, it and it really works. If you want to be inspired, go to our website and go to the Healthy Ga- uh, Baby Gallery. Just put that in the search engine, Healthy Baby Gallery, and see the photographs of these beautiful babies who were born to parents who followed our principles. It really works. The babies are strong, they're healthy, they speak early, they don't need braces, they have beautiful, broad faces. Uh, This is our hope for the future, is these babies. And we're here to tell you how how to do it. It does not happen by chance. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's it's not. And... um Coming back to this diet that you mentioned, is the liver pate and the caviar diet. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's important that, that we, we really have, you know, also quality resources for that. And it's better to yeah. make our liver pate at home, for example, because what, yeah. we, we can get liver pate in stores in Hungary, but you don't want to read the ingredients labels. Of that. I know, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. And Just make it at home or... Caviar. And you can yeah. you you don't want to read the ingredients of that either. So it's you know so either you, have you buy fish eggs and salt, fish eggs and salt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's just uh, you have to make your research <laughs> to to find the the raw right. fish eggs or frozen or and then like support the people who are doing things right. Support the farmers. Give them your food your food dollars. Um, the only way this is we're going to keep on doing this is to support these wonderful farmers and wonderful manufacturers who are doing things properly. Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, about uh, raising healthy babies and healthy child, it's, um, you know, the introduction of, of grains. This is something that I, I really want to address because what I yeah. see is that this is like the first thing they, they get introduced to. I know. It's the uh... ones that you mentioned. <laughs> so can you address <laughs> that for a little bit? <laughs> Yes, that's the advice that's given to parents. The first things they get is rice cereal, which is very poor in nutrition and uh, it introduces them to grains way too early. We say it, wait at least one year and maybe even two years before you int- introduce the grains. And you want your children to be able general, to eat. Right? Pardon me? So the grains in general are also non gluten, I mean, gluten free and gluten containing grains. Either either type and properly prepared, but wait till the baby has a certain amount of maturity uh, before yeah. you introduce these grains. And also, um, they should be with fats. So fats on the bread, fats in the rice, uh, lard in the beans, whatever. Uh, you need to have them with with good fats. And what you, the goal is to have children who can be perfectly healthy and exist in the world. They don't have to uh, be different in avoiding grains and be different from their classmates or anything. You want children yeah. who can exist as a normal person in the world. And, um, and you know, they're all going to eat bad food sometimes. You, you can't help that. But if you get them off to a good start, uh, they'll be able to tolerate a certain amount of that. Yeah, and... 
for those who are completely beginners in this whole thing in switching to a healthier diet and healthier lifestyle, what would you recommend? Like, what are the top offenders of modern diets that we should avoid at all costs? We have partially mentioned some. Yeah, uh, the industrial oil. seed oils. So the cooking yeah. oils, the um, the anything that comes from soy, canola, uh, corn, uh, all of these uh, oils, even sunflower and safflower. Uh, are they industrially processed calories. and and they really that's that's the number one thing to get out of the diet. So all the foods containing them. Number two would be high fructose corn syrup, which is used in so many foods now. Uh, sugar is very important to avoid, but a little sugar is not going to hurt you as much as that high fructose corn syrup. Mm, yeah. Okay, and we mentioned the MSG uh, stuff. So, and of course uh, the MSG. Yes, that would be that. number three. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and we we mentioned refined carbohydrates that we should use the properly prepared grains prepared, if, we, right. if we choose to use the grains. Okay. And by and the way, the MSG is usually not labeled. It's usually called something like yeast extract or hydrolyzed protein. Uh, there's um, you can just but you can just assume that all processed foods have MSG in them in one form or another. Yeah, it's just it's just better to avoid them all. But yes, right. Make learn to cook. <laughs> learn to cook and cook from scratch and and choose ingredients that are that are looking the same as, as they are looking in the in the nature, right? Right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I've heard you many times saying this the natural selection of wife and it was it would be the closing thought <laughs> of this uh-huh. interview. Um, can you expand on that, on this statement, what what you mean by that? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the statement. This natural selection of wise. Oh, the selection of the wise. <laughs> uh, well, I think this is what's happening now. Now, we all know this principle of natural selection, the selection of the fit, the selection of the strong. But what we're seeing today is the natural selection of the wise. And this is, it seems cruel, but this is how nature works. So the people who are not wise enough to eat properly and have healthy children, these families will die out. Either the young do not reach reproductive age, or if they do reach that age, they will not reproduce. And we're seeing widespread infertility today. Um, In the States, it's about one couple in four cannot get pregnant and some of them get pregnant only with great, great difficulty. And so this will just get worse and worse in the families and the individuals who still eat processed foods. So this is what I mean by the natural selection of the wise. It is the wise who will survive and have healthy children and be the leaders of the future, the people who build civilization in the future. Yeah, that sounds Oh, that sounds motivational and scary at the same time. <laughs> but, it, well, know. that's exactly right. It is scary. It's an implacable law. It's not. It's not something we can change. And Dr. Price said, "Life in its fullness is Mother Nature obeyed." We we really must understand these laws, the laws of good nutrition, or we will not lead full lives, and we will just not survive. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm, thank you so much. I, I think it's it's time to close this interview at this point with this beautiful thought. And thank you so much well, for the information you provided. You're a, wonderful, you're a wonderful interviewer, and I'm thrilled that you're there in Hungary. I think uh, we could really start something uh, very big in your country. I think there's still a lot of memories of the traditional diets, and uh, people. Yeah. you still have a lot of resources. I would yeah, suggest, yeah, yeah, go to our website, westonaprice.org, W-E-S-T-O-N-A-P-R-I-C-E.org. And on the right-hand column is something called Take a Tour. And if you're new to our website, that's where I suggest you start, at Take a Tour, and go through that. And then you'll find answers to almost all your questions on the website as well. And then um, support uh, Caitlin and what she's doing in Hungary, and I'm sure that you will make wonderful and great changes. <laughs> Thank you. So we, I'm going to uh, provide a, a link to, to the chapter's uh, local website, um, which good. is you know, a pretty long one, <laughs> but I'm going okay, to good. provide a, a link for that. 
And yeah, I'm putting together this resources list uh, for quality resource for quality food uh, ingredients and and suppliers. And yeah, it's I, I would be happy if anyone could contribute to to the list. It's you know it's growing yeah, and evolving. Good. And thank you so much for all this information uh. once again. And um, you know, people will learn a lot from it, and I hope they also start to implement these principles. You know, maybe one at a time, or one family, or one person at a time. But the important thing is to find our way back to healthy, nourishing tra traditions. You know, back to the natural ways, and get back our health, and have healthy bodies, healthy minds, and healthy babies. So healthy babies. That's the number one. Yeah. Our number one concern today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Sally. Again. Thank you. Thank you for pleasure. having me, and best oh, of luck. You. Keep in touch. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.